and welcome back to the live series podcast brought to you by Amicus Recruitment. This is the podcast that brings you uh, global tech leaders and news from all over the world. Today, I'm joined by Andre Nita, uh, Director of Data Analytics. Um, how are you doing, Andre? Yeah, I'm uh, very good. Thank you for having me. Um, excited, yeah, to uh, take part in the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited for this one too. I know when um, one of our consultants, Frankie, kind of got us in touch with each other, um, I was super psyched because Frankie kind of came over and was like, you want to talk about these really interesting subjects. And it's something that I'm personally really interested in as well. And, and when we chatted briefly before, it, it sounded um, like you've got some really cool ideas. So um, let's just dive straight in. So obviously I said you're at director level. Um, I, I've, I've had a cheeky glance at your LinkedIn. Um, but unless people sort of haven't really heard of your work before or haven't come across you before, um, just give me a little bit of background on your, uh, your expertise and, and your experience up to now. Yeah, um, I guess it's been quite broad. I mean, my uh, my major uh, in university has been in electronics. Um, so I've, uh, I guess, diverged. Um, I've, I've had quite the journey since then. I've, um, you know, initially moved from the um, electronics sector to... Um, IT, so I did technical support, I did system administration, um, I did consultancy, uh, full stack development, then kind of moved into the BI field and and thought oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll keep going with it, and uh, eventually landed on data engineering, and you know uh, several years down the line, um, I I now run the data department. So um, I I think yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey. Uh, but it's definitely something that I realize that I'm very passionate about, which is which is data. Um, sure, that's I think um, the amount of people that I meet on this podcast, and obviously um, hearing that they're passionate and hearing that as an opener is is a very good start. Like a lot of time, like someone will talk about their experience and and they'll just kind of like wave it off. I guess it's difficult to kind of they feel like they're blowing their own trumpet, but you can already tell that you're uh, super passionate about what you're doing. Um, so when we chatted before, obviously we spoke about something else to do with the world of work that you're passionate about. And that was kind of diversity and inclusion within the workplace. Um, it, again, it's something that I'm super passionate about. I head up the wellbeing committee at Amicus and um, like, yeah, I'm, I've been really excited to chat with you about it. So. Um, I'm going to kind of like start off on talking about diversity um, with a what might be quite a kind of tough question to put you on the spot with, but we're talking tech, we're talking tech teams um, and individuals within tech teams. Um, obviously, tech isn't widely known. I mean, obviously, I'm sure you can expand on this um, as someone in the industry directly, but tech isn't widely known to be the most diverse industry. Um, and so um, kind of is that up to leaders or is that up to kind of the teams themselves? Is it a collaboration? Like where do we, where do we start the conversation about diversity in tech? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's, it's important to realize that the, the market really isn't there to promote diversity. There aren't enough um, um, uh, profiles out there that kind of promote diversity. So um in a way, is it our responsibility? Yes. Should we just rely on what's on the market? No. We should we should build the market. We should we should have the market that we need and not rely on the market that we have. Um, now, of course, traditionally, you know, when whenever you said tech, you said engineering, programming, what whatever it would be, um, you know, gender wise, you would think. Uh, uh, you know, a male candidate would be uh, the the one they will apply. And recently, yeah, I I, I opened up, uh, for example, a, a senior data engineer role, um, and I think I had fifty to hundred applicants. Almost all of them were male, um, and you know that that just that just proves that you shouldn't rely on just whoever applies and just um, you know. Um, whatever you're being sent, you should go out there and be active in, in your approach and, and, and promote diversity. I was reading a book recently that was saying um, how you can improve decision making and how you know you, you can basically have better judgments. And it, it was saying that let's say you have a person that um, is good at um, um, you know taking decisions, um, let's say seventy percent of the time. Um, and then you have another person that is also good at taking decisions 70% of the time. Well, the average of the two will still be 70%. Yeah. 
But if you have a person who's average, let's say who is good seventy uh, percent of the time at making a decision, and you get somebody who's maybe um, let's say forty percent, but that forty percent doesn't overlap with that seventy percent of the other person, then you can take that seventy even more, because the person that is good at taking decisions will listen to another opinion, and that's diversity for you, right? Absolutely. It's yeah bringing bringing more views bringing more creative approaches, doing things differently. If we always have the same exact people that take the same decisions, nothing will change and we won't innovate. We won't be creative. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's a, it's a lack of understanding from a leadership perspective then in terms of, of I know you're saying you're reading, obviously I'm, I'm assuming you kind of that analogy that you used, um, but I, I, miss that. I feel like it makes it makes so much sense. It's almost common sense um, to, to put it like that when hiring. Um, but is it is there a lack of understanding from that perspective? Do you think um, kind of the yes, the I would say so. Then? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would say it is. Yeah, because it's quite a different way of thinking about things. And it's not something that um, managers or leaders, you know, have been exposed to in the past. Um, but um, you know, you can have a lot of advantages by just thinking diversity first. One, the, one of the examples that I um, I gave was decision making, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it could also be uh, the culture of the company. Of course, that's I think the main thing people think about. You know, the culture will be um, uh, more inclusive, uh, um, friendlier. You know, more flexible, because you have more people from more uh, varied backgrounds or you know, uh, gender, race, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. So. You, you would always have more advantages than disadvantages than w when you focus on on diversity. I think that's something that people have to realize. Um, they just think, I'll, I'm just going to get the, the best person for, for the job, of course. But that doesn't mean you always have to keep the same pool. You should expand your pool or you should change the job. If you're only looking for seniors, you're always going to have to rely on who is, wh whomever has already done that role for five, 10 years. That's not going to change the market. Mm -hmm. You need to hire some juniors as well, because that will open up the pool to to people that have not had a chance to work in that market. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think as well, it's really interesting that you say like, because you kind of segued me into what was going to be my next question and sort of half answered it essentially that I was going to kind of ask what what key kind of situations would a, would a tech leader specifically find themselves in where they would benefit from diversity? Because personally, well, not even personally, I think it's, there is a, a small general consensus of, I was, I was watching a webinar the other day on it, um, and someone said that diversity has almost become kind of this word that has this kind of PC sort of stigma attached to it, where people just see it as being encouraged to tick boxes or label people. And that's already getting off to the wrong foot because you are literally looking for you know, like you said, gender, ethnic, di physical differences in people instead of, like you said, mental differences, they're different approaches to things, they're different solutions to tasks and challenges that you're going to face. Yeah, absolutely, um, because yeah. diversity diversity is diverse as well. Right? Yeah. There are so many aspects where you can think about how a person might be diverse from another person. Um, it could be what's... Um, what um, uh, major they might have had in university, right? That could be another um, way to to increase diversity. If you're only going to hire people from computer science backgrounds, let's say for engineering roles, right? That won't promote diversity. But if you hire somebody that comes from, I don't know, an architecture uh, background and then has done some courses and has done some self-learning to move into computer science and become an engineer, that's definitely going to increase diversity because you're going to have such a, different way of looking at things from somebody let's say who studied architecture yeah but, yeah i think we should we definitely shouldn't just consider you know let's say gender race ethnicity whatever it is uh, um uh, where they where they come from you know uh, you know which country they come from i think it should be as as broad as possible uh sky's the limit i think yeah i totally agree with you and as well it's interesting that you bring up about getting different kind of you know degrees or majors or anything like that because it, i think it says a lot about that person um kind of that specific kind of mindset of shifting th shifting from one thing to the next and i like put i personally would like i would love that in a, as an in a leadership position to have someone who has come from so, a different kind of 
um, set up in their life and then kind of shifted towards this because it's not like they haven't just kind of gone with the same motions that the same people have as well. Like if you do kind of a computer, it's not that it's not okay to do a computer science degree, but if someone has and they've, they've done the same modules, they say, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 people on that course and then they're all applying for the same jobs. Whereas like you said, someone who's done some sort of management degree or anything that anything a little bit different, um, it's it's so kind of, for me, strange that they would actually be probably considered less for a role because they have a less relevant degree um, and no, and there's not that kind of open-mindedness towards kind of how much they can actually attribute um, to, towards a role. So for how, how, how do you then actually open up that talent pool? Where do you find these diverse team members? Um, so I, I've been talking about this um, quite a bit and I've been posting on LinkedIn as well. Um, what do you want to have before you um, um, just start hiring, let's say, uh, more diverse people is to ensure that you have the environment already um, set up for, for when they would join. So you need um, you need people that will, will mentor them, that will, will help them. You need the environment to be inclusive. And then it's it's um you know it's going to be a much better uh start for um, um the people that you would hire um so one example would be um like the senior data engineer i i couldn't find you know uh, non-males it was difficult because everyone who applied was a male maybe one or two females i think in in the pool um so i thought okay well the senior data engineer probably won't be the role where I, where I can increase the diversity. So then let me remove the tech requirement. The ones that I have now, I'll just prepare them to become mentors and I'll have them be completely independent. And then I'm going to hire some juniors and that will open up um, the, the talent pool much more because I won't ask for any experience. All I will ask for is, let's say, strong coding skills, uh, SQL, um, and just somebody passionate and that is eager to learn. And in in that way, you know, I increase diversity um, from let's say no female engineers to now two female engineers. Um, and I, I already had two male engineers. So that makes you know a 50-50 gender split, for example. Um, but of course, there are other types of diversity as well that I also managed to handle in the exact same way, just by looking um, at you know a wider pool by removing the tech requirement or by removing the experience requirement and just changing the roles. Instead of hiring only seniors, hire some juniors. You don't need a, a team full of seniors. You need one or two seniors, then help out the market, get some interns, get some juniors in there. And you'll have seniors in, in two, three years anyway, for everybody, not just you know for, for that company. Mm. What do you say to the argument that um, if, if you're kind of going out this way and making extra hires and asking more of your team, in order to cater for, for this diverse team member, let's let's just call them, um, why not just hire a male that could just have done it in the first place? Um, well, it's, well, I mean, that's more about um, estimating how much load you would have. Um, so uh, if you would have enough load, let's say for just one senior, you don't have enough work for anyone else, then yeah, just get one senior. But if you would have enough work for, let's say up to five people, then you could get two that are quite senior, mid to senior, and then you can get some juniors. Uh, I, I think that's more of a question about planning, about uh, you know budgeting, about other aspects. Um, of course, I'm not saying completely compromise you know the integrity of your team, but just focusing on diversity. It's it's everything. Everything should play into into the decision because yeah. if you're compromising the team. Then I'm I'm going I'm going back to the first statement, which was ensure that you have the environment. You need to have a stable environment, right? Mm -hmm. If you're compromising the team, you no longer have the stable environment. So the whole point of hiring diverse roles and hiring diverse teams, sorry, uh, falls on the ground. Yeah, I agree with everything you say. I wasn't going on the attack there. I was, uh, I was no, no, yeah. <laughs> devil's advocate to an extent. <laughs> Um, because that sometimes that is the argument of like, well, if, you know, why not just hire a guy if he can do it? Um, but you've obviously um, proved that you don't need to, um, and it is easy enough to just. And, and on top of that, you've then got extra team members um, who can adapt to the way that your team is working as well. So you'll ultimately end up with a stronger dynamic. 
Um, I just think it's really, yeah, it's, you make it sound so easy as well. And I'm sure it is just as easy to do. Like it's not. Yeah. I think we should simplify <laughs> our lives. Um, yeah, you know, sure. We tend to overcomplicate. I think that's just the, the human brain, right? We always want to overcomplicate things, but really we should find the simplicity and the elegance in, in, in the world. Sure. I want to talk about hiring processes a little bit, um, mainly just because obviously you said a little bit there about how you would remove a little bit of the tech stack or how would you, you know, you would, you know, adjust kind of the, the job description say, um, to, to find the right person. Um, what does your ideal kind of hiring process look like for your, for your teams? Ideal hiring process. Um, okay. I guess to answer the question about, um, removing the tech stack it's it's more about focusing on the fundamentals because if you have very strong fundamentals you can pick up other technologies other tools whatever it is so it's mainly about removing the tools i don't want to lock people into tools i want to have people that are uh, very very strong on the fundamentals uh and they can pick up any technology and any tool in in, in no time um so that that would answer that uh, question um on the process itself um it's for, for data, it has to be quick, right? Uh, if we talk about data, um, the market is very competitive. If you don't make, uh, move quick enough, then that candidate will just go somewhere else or they will lose interest. Um, so what I don't advocate is a take home test. Um, I feel like we've moved past it. People don't want to do their homework. They never wanted to do their homework. They had to because everyone was asking for it. I would say eliminate the take home test. Um, unless it's a very, very critical technical role where you definitely need to be sure that that person is up to the mark, skip it. Um, the first interview for me is a live coding round. Uh, I want to see, um, you know, how a person, um, can answer theoretical questions, but also I want to see some practical um, implementations of uh, just simple, very simple exercises, really, just to get an idea of how quickly they they can write code and how they handle pressure, right? Because it's pressure, it's a pressure kind of, um, it, it's, it's high pressure to have somebody watching you while you work, of course, especially if it's to land a, a role. Um, after that, it's usually a, a culture round. I do the culture round right after. Um, and if, if they pass both, uh, the third one is generally just a meet and greet to see how that person would, uh, you know, work with the team, uh, the team gets to ask questions. Um, and in general, yeah, three, three rounds is, um, is a, is a good amount for, for, for the data market right now. And, um, I don't think, I don't think I've had anyone drop out that would have said three is too many. Um. So we have, we, yeah. you know, we, with, with three interviews, you can, we can wrap up even a, within a week, the, the whole process, which is, I think, very good. That's super efficient. Yeah, definitely. I know like obviously working in a room full of recruiters, I, 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 some, I can hear murmurs of like seven or eight stage interviews sometimes and, and, yeah. and undertake contest and, um, as a as a marketer, I'm I'm definitely someone who isn't a, isn't a, a fan of this even the sound of a take home test. Yeah. Um, it's not Absolutely. it's not necessarily something that every industry has to do, but I, I think you're right in saying that it's it's you know from the, especially from the, the people that I've spoken to in leadership on this podcast that they, they, they pretty much majority agree that that tech tests are a thing of the past and they're pretty old school. Um, what? Yeah. yeah oh, <laughs> sorry, go on. Gonna... No, I was saying. You, yeah. You're shooting yourself in the foot, really. If you if you put a take home test, it's like saying, "Well, I'm just gonna willingly give up half of the candidates because they lose interest, and I'll just stick with whomever uh, is left." But you know, um, we've had um, um, we've had candidates do the take home test. Um, they sent it to us. Oh yeah, it looked good, and then we did the live coding round anyway. They couldn't answer any of the questions because what they were doing is they were just having a friend or a family member do the test for them or paying someone to do the test for them. Um, so it's meaningless. It's pointless. I wouldn't even yeah. bother because they can just cheat at home. How, how would you check unless you do a live round? Yeah, they can just cheat. And as well, I think a good point that someone made previously is that if you have a really good candidate, it's likely that they're in more than one uh, process and then they've got like four or five tech tests to be doing and you're just going to 
lose yep. them basically and they're going to be going to the role that doesn't ask that much of them um, and, and I think yeah so I totally agree with you there definitely um are there any kind of pitfalls in hiring processes just kind of linking back to diversity a little bit um are there any kind of pitfalls that you maybe you've seen or experienced or that you might have be, might be aware of um in hiring processes that um for lack of a better word are exclusionary towards like in, you know getting a diverse team together um is that something that that you that you're aware of or you've seen um could you give me an example just so i can have a clear sure idea? so i definitely should have prepared one before asking that question um so we don't just have dead air while i try and think but um i definitely in terms of so um yeah it, <laughs> It's, I think maybe more of a mindset, so someone's attitude within a, within a like an unconscious bias, maybe for example, in right. culture test, um, like you said, say someone gets through to the, the kind of the meet and greet. Um, Got it. How to avoid it, bias in in a recruiting process? Sure, sure, yeah. That's oh, yeah, that's a very uh, tough question, but um, I would say it's by by definitely preparing your hiring managers and and and. Um, your recruiters to make sure that bias doesn't even come into into play. Um, I was I I actually posted I think one day um, how to you know land a junior data engineer role and one of the topics was resume and I was saying you know it's good to just have a photo in there because you know um, you're helping the recruiter see everything about you in one go. They'll see your title, they'll see your description, they'll see a photo, they see your email, whatever it is. And somebody asked. But what if the recruiter is biased? And before I answer, somebody else answered for me. You don't want to work with that recruiter. Uh, so I would say it's it's important to train people to remove bias. And it's something that is very trainable. The the book that I was telling you about where I read about the decision making, the book is about noise and bias, uh, written by Daniel Kahneman, who wrote uh, Thinking Fast and Slow as well. Um, so it's definitely something you can you can train how to remove noise and bias from decision making. Um, what, what I would say is just take a glance at the photo. Don't make any decisions from it. If anything, if somebody puts a photo, it just shows that they're open and they, they, there's nothing to hide. They have a photo in there um, and they've taken the effort to do an extra thing, right? To put the photo in. Um, then um, make no judgments about anything else that you see, um, where they're from, um, unless, you know, they're from a country where you need to give a visa and you can't afford to sponsor your visas. Maybe then, you know, don't make the judgment, but ask the question, <laughs> you know, at least, um, it, how, how is your visa status? Are you, you know, are you okay with that? Yes. Perfect. Let's proceed. Um, so I think it's more about, um, not, not making any judgments, um, more, more around just asking and just being open-minded. Um, but yeah, there's definitely it's, something you can train. Yeah, point. I like the idea that you can train it. Um, and it's definitely, like you say, I think something that we spoke about on the phone briefly before um, that, I, that I do want to kind of touch on is kind of drawing that there is a, a difference between asking someone something about either something that you've gathered from their appearance for practical reasons um, and asking it rationally um, and not having to step on eggshells and this and then there's kind of the other half of it where you can do have to question are you tapping into your unconscious bias by asking that and it shouldn't really be a difficult question but I suppose a lot of people do have an issue with it um how you know how how do you I know you said you've made some some really interesting um hires and it sounds like you've got obviously a super diverse team um where you are currently um whereas I, I do want to know kind of what in terms of attitude towards hiring uh, with the intention of hiring a diverse team, it's got to be difficult to get that balance right of, of not walking on eggshells, being sensitive towards people's preferences or whatever, um, and then also just getting the job done and, and, not, and not feeling like you are just ticking boxes and that you are actually tuning into what that person needs as well. Honestly, I, I don't see it all as, as ticking boxes. I think it's about having the proper mindset, you know, having the 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 motivation, the proper motivation to to start doing it. Um, the way I kind of see it is, um, for example, again, let me go back to decision making. Um, a non-diverse team, I would equate it to an a la carte menu. I always know what I get 
It's never a surprise. You know, nothing's going to change. Oh, I know. But a diverse team will be more like a buffet, mm -hmm. right? Where I can also have, I don't know, I can have an omelet making station where I can customize my own omelet and I can make my own waffles and so on and so forth. So it's more about giving myself infinite choices rather than having the exact same, cho same choice day in, day out. Yeah. It's not about ticking boxes, not about anything for me other than I know this is better because of so many reasons, because we we need more choices always in life, right? That's mm -hmm. why there are so many shows to watch on Netflix. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we can't just watch the same um, the same Christmas movie every every year. You know, we'll, we we do watch it, but we want to watch. I was going to say, I'm definitely, well. <laughs> yeah, <for sure>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely guilty of watching Elf at least twelve times during Christmas. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so when just out of curiosity, like when did you first start? I know we, we spoke about your experience right at the beginning, so I probably would have been better to ask that at the beginning. But when did you first notice um, a kind of lack of diversity, let's call it, in tech when you first started out? Um, university, I would yeah. say. Um, there were, I would imagine, if I remember correctly, 80 or 100 of us, uh, six were female, for example. Um, so it i think it starts at at university at high school you know uh, it starts early i am um, i don't think it's a problem on the job market it's a problem way before that where there have been these biases that have been you know perpetuated where um you know if it's engineering oh you know i have a boy and a girl i'll send the boy to the engineering school um right you should you should let everyone decide whatever they want make make it clear you know what are um um, what are the things that they will learn if, the, if they're passionate about um, and, and not necessarily kind of um, push, let's say, um, someone to, to go into that sector just because, oh, boys go into engineering. Yeah. Um, um, so I think it starts much earlier than, than the job market and that's probably where we, we would have to address it. Just remove the biases from, you know, who, who should do what job. Everyone should do whatever job they want, yeah. whatever they're passionate about. 100%, of course. Um, it, it... It's interesting that you say that because I, I've never really thought about it starting that young. Um, obviously, when you notice it at university, because you've been put in that situation um, where it's physically in front of you, how little kind of, let's use women, for an example, uh, are in tech or engineering. Um, but do you think that kind of mindset, obviously, it's a gen maybe... I was going to say it's a generational thing. I'm not too sure. Maybe it, but it definitely that kind of mentality does tr trickle down naturally. That kind of bias of, you know, gender in roles almost. Um, do you think that people currently, let's say males in engineering or tech currently, let's say kind of um, they get their first female um, member on their engineering team? And they're not necessarily in a leadership level. They might be like a tech lead or a senior or, or a dev. And, and they're kind of, should they, should they change their reaction to that person being onboarded? Should they adapt um, in a certain way to kind of accommodate the fact that a female's joined their team, do you think? Or do you think the best thing to do is to just kind of pretend like she's almost one of the guys, which I hate that phrase, but um, you know what I mean, don't you? Like, I don't know what you're, you're I... attitude. No, that's a fair question. I think everyone should adapt that every time. Um, I read this term that it was called perpetual beta. Uh, it's when uh, something was released as a beta, right? Uh, it's not the final product, but because it's in perpetual beta, it can always evolve. But we as humans can also be, you know, always in the beta, beta stage. So we, we can all always evolve. I would say be as flexible as you can, adapt to everything. Um, I I don't agree with business as usual. If something has changed, you you have to change as well. Um, so I would say always adapt to um, um, to outside factors. Um, so if somebody new joins that is different from whomever was there before, however many uh, many people there might have been there before, those people should adapt. Um, just like that person then that goes into that environment would adapt. So I don't think you know there's a majority that should just stay the same and the minority should should adapt to the majority. I think everyone should adapt. Yeah, that's a really important key point that you've said there, that the minority shouldn't have to adapt to the majority. Um, I think yeah, it shouldn't be one-sided, sorry. 
both sides yeah. should, should adapt is what I was saying, just to be clear, yeah. Yeah, no, I know, I know what you're saying. Um, but I think that is kind of that mentality when you know you're in a minority entering a workplace, it, 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 you know, and, and it is business as usual. I totally agree with you. I think that's that's not the right mindset to have. Um, yeah. And it, but when you know, some sometimes it might be, and and that that isn't right because obviously you are then forcing that person who is m- potentially aware already that they're a minority, and you're forcing them to adapt on their own to your way of working, which is not their way of working. And yeah, <clears throat> lack of adaptability is a massive point, I think, um, in diversity. Um, yeah. In terms of how your, I know you said that you've you've kind of brought on some juniors. Um, is 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 there a Obviously, I'm not sure what kind of age range is, um, but do you think age plays a factor in people's attitudes towards diversity? In the work, um, to specify. I haven't, um, I haven't uh, thought about it to be honest. Um, the age range, uh, because you know, you asked me about the age range. Um, it's it's generally uh, fresh graduates. Um, that I've kind of focused on just to remove that experience aspect. Um, so 22, 24, I would imagine, or depending yeah. if they've done masters or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of age range, um, because it's 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 great if they already have the you know the the information fresh in their minds right after right after bachelor's or, or masters. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, and. I'll try to answer your question, but would it be the age range of the diverse person or the age range of the people that are looking for a more diverse person? On which side? On both sides? So that's a good point, because when I asked it, um, I essentially meant the kind of the age range of, you know, kind of an older attitude versus, uh, let's, say, let's say, old school attitude, for lack of a better phrase, towards, mm-hmm. like, you say, graduates and people who, you know, diversity is just not... I, I think in the, in the wider world outside of work and outside of tech there is obviously you know you kind of have the very cliche kind of demographics of who's kind of more adaptable who's less flexible in terms of how old they are yeah um, got it a better awesome. way of rephrasing my question would have been do you think is, that enters into into engineering or tech or tech teams right well i think that's an interesting question because you could say at the same time right age groups th- th- those could be a way to uh, increase diversity right sure. um if all of your, let's say, I don't know, you have a team of data scientists, if all of them are 20 to 30, then it's not a very diverse team because everyone is kind of, you know, young, as you would say. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you could hire somebody at uh, 50 years old, right? That already increases the diversity because it adds another blip on a graph, right? If this was the age range, you had a lot of uh, a lot of people here then you add another blip over here at the 50 um so that could be one um, um i remember um one specific um uh, recruiting process that i was a part of and um there were two different interview rounds in which they were trying to gauge if i could manage a person that was 65 years old um if you would come in by the way by the way, we have this person that has been with us for 30 years. They want to still stay in this role. And, you know, one of your main roles would be to manage them. Uh, and like, okay, I don't see the problem. Why don't see why, why I need to have like so many conversations? I understand. Yeah, fine. They're 60, 65. But why are we making such a big deal out of it? Right. You know, I don't understand why we need to have like so many rounds just so you can get convinced that I can manage this one person. You should, you know, you should just have interviews that I can manage every person. You know, I think they were making more of a case of it, right? And they were attack- attacking it or approaching it from the wrong, uh, from the wrong side. You know, yeah. it's great. You know, you have a more diverse person, right? They're 65. The other people are 30, 35. What's the problem? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, yeah. so I, I think that's it, yeah. isn't it? With, with kind of the unbiased conscious, like they, they obviously would have probably i imagine felt like they had the best intentions kind of like almost pre-warning yeah. you which does sound ridiculous when you put it like that but essentially that is what you're doing. <laughs> you know like it's like yeah. oh, there's an old person here or something like that it's like yeah it's bizarre um so that's it, a really was, good point that you make and, yeah. and it was a little bit of a, a tricky question to kind of throw at you um but I'm, I'm just interested to hear like i think diversity is such a huge 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 topic um 
Um, and I'm, in, I'm really interested to hear about it in, in tech and engineering because it is, like I said at the beginning, uh, uh, sort of stereotypically one of the, the lesser diverse kind of industries. And um, and, and I've, 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 I just, I've absolutely loved getting your, your interpretation on everything. Obviously, there's a lots of book recommendations in there. Um, I'll try and get a link down to everything in there as well. Um, and I'm definitely going to go and read the book. Which one was the, the book, the decision making? Um, I think, I don't remember the whole title, but it's Noise. And okay. one of the main authors is uh, Daniel Kahneman. Well, I'm definitely going to go and check that one out because that one sounds yeah. really good. You can me. definitely find his other one, Thinking oh. Fast and Slow. That's okay. very well known. And you'll probably find, let's say you go on Amazon or another website, a link to the other one. That's probably yeah. going to be easier. <laughs> I'll definitely stick them in the YouTube link at the bottom and, uh, and in the Spotify yeah. bio as well. Um, so I'm just going to kind of, I, I genuinely would love to have you back, by the way, as well, because I feel like there's a million different niches within this kind of topic that we could talk about. Um, yeah. But I'm just going to kind of wrap up um, just with like a couple of questions about you and how you work. Um, and essentially, like, why, so I always kind of ask um, my guests in three words, how would your kind of teams or past colleagues or uh, anyone that you've kind of worked with, how, how would they describe you, do you think? Oh, okay. Um, I would say driven, um, always available just because I tend to always have, um, you know, my email on my phone or my, my, my chat on my phone. So I always answer. Um, and um, um, I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes I guess, you know, overbearing because I could be quite, uh, you know, quite demanding because um, I'm, I'm a very uh, passionate advocate of, doing things at a very uh, to a very high degree of quality um so i want things to be done so that you know your your end users your customers your clients however you want to call them your stakeholders you see their face light up right they're happy and like this is exactly what i wanted or this is more than what i wanted um so you know if you want to get to that level and you want to be constant in in, in relentless delivery um you know sometimes it, it can be intense so i i think yeah um those are probably the the three three words <laughs> that i would use <laughs> you definitely get that impression from you that you are super driven and super passionate um yeah. it's 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 actually it's been a super a super easy kind of not easy but it's you know it's it's definitely been one of the the most kind of easy flowing conversations that i've had on on the pod because um, I think because partly you are so passionate and driven and you've not you've not um kind of hesitated once and and, and it's it's excellent really um so my last real question is is what advice would you have for people looking to be in a similar position to you wow okay um I would say um don't just rely on on the role don't just rely on on um you know, um, getting to um, getting to a senior position um, just by going in day in day out, um, you you'll want to do more and more things outside of work as well. They will help you within your work. Um, I'm actually thinking of an article to write about, you know, how communication skills, how presentation skills um, are very important, if not mandatory to have these days for any sort of person working in data um, um, because you you always interact with somebody and you have to present what what you what you've worked on you even sometimes have to sell what you've worked on so I think those skills are very important so anything that helps you um, you know increase your communication skills public speaking um, improvisational theater um, I don't know anything really um that that can kind of help you acting um i would definitely recommend those um so i i would say yeah um pursue things outside of work not just rely on things at work and diversify you know your your skill set um uh, don't just focus on tools focus on platforms focus on frameworks uh, focus on the fundamentals 
hopefully yeah. that will help somebody <laughs> <laughs> i love that focus on the fundamentals is, is a really good shout um and i think like you said kind of almost soft skills like don't really get the um the the look in that they that they could do these days um honestly andre it's it's i'm kind of i'm kind of got it to be wrapping it up really because like i said at the beginning it is it's a subject that i'm really really interested in um so i'd love to have you back sometime um but definitely thank you so much for for your time today and uh i'm really excited for this one to be released i know uh our consultant frankie who um who kind of introduced us he, he's super passionate about this topic as well so it's there's a little bit of a buzz going around and i can't wait to get back and let him know tell him everything that we spoke about um but yeah so if time for the spiel if you're watching on youtube you can hover over the logo in the corner hit subscribe and then you can kind of flick through and watch the rest of the other episodes as well they're all really cool uh follow us on instagram tiktok uh, facebook twitter linkedin head over to our website amicusjobs.com for tech news webinars blogs and keep up to date on all the latest python golang and javascript and machine learning roles all over the globe i, I literally never get it in one breath i've tried it so many times and i never managed um thank you so much andre um it's honestly been a real real pleasure Thank you. No, yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, very passionate about the subject, so I'm so glad that we got to talk about it. Um, you've been a great host. Um, more than happy to come back uh, and discuss any other topics that you know you might be uh, keen to approach. Uh, so thanks for having me again. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out, please message, uh, drop me a message on LinkedIn, and I'd be more than happy to reply. I'll stick a link to your LinkedIn as well, along with those book recommendations down in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much again, Andrea. Thank you. Bye.